Well, good evening. Welcome to our Thursday, I mean Wednesday evening class here at the Douglas Hills Church of Christ, where we're continuing our study and concluding our study in the books of Judges and Ruth. Tonight we're in Lesson 13, which is the second part of the book of Ruth in chapters 3 and 4. So as we can begin our study tonight, we're going to look at chapters 3 and 4 and continue where Mark left off last uh, Wednesday evening. Just kind of an advanced warning, next Wednesday evening, Mark will begin a study, Mark McCrary, in a study in the book of 1 Samuel, which he's entitled The Coming of the Kings. So continue this story of leading into the last judge being Samuel and then into the coming of the kings of Saul and David. So let's just pick up our study here in chapter 3 of the book of Ruth. In chapter 3 of the book of Ruth, really I've entitled this Naomi's plan. It seems as if the harvest was drawing to a close and Naomi's thoughts turned to the well-being of Ruth. And as chapter 3 opens, there's, she asks two questions of Ruth that really shape the rest of the story. In verse 1, she says, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Verse 2, now is not Boaz our kinsman with whose maid you were? The first question, she yet turns to Ruth and she identifies her as her daughter. A very much a term of endearment, Naomi felt responsible for Ruth and her well-being. And she asked this question to her, shall I not seek security for you? It's really talking about the idea of a place of rest, of comfort. She's really inquiring if she should seek a mate, uh, a husband, for Ruth. Really, in the book of Ruth, is one of the only illustrations we have of what we call in the Old Testament a leveret marriage. A leveret marriage comes from the Latin word lever, which means brother-in-law. And it's the idea, at least as it's related in Deuteronomy chapter 25, of how a brother will marry the wife of his deceased brother to continue to uh, care for her and protect the family name and the land property rights. In the book of Ruth, at least as it, she relates to Boaz, this is the, really the only illustration of how that plan works out in its fullness, an illustration of that plan in action. So she asks that question to Ruth. Do you want a place of security? Do you want a husband so that it will be well with you? The second question points out that now is not Boaz, our kinsman. She calls Boaz the redeemer, the, the closest, the kinsman. And Mark pointed out the fact that this kinsman, this, relation, this, this relationship that exists in the Old Testament, bared several types of responsibilities. They would the avenge the death of a murdered relative. They would marry a childless widow of a deceased brother. They would buy back family land that had been sold. They would buy a family member who had been sold into indentured servitude. And they would look after needy and helpless members of their family. She says, consider Boaz our kinsman. Now in this statement, she brings up in the very last point, kind of a, a, just as an afterthought, to kind of mention to Ruth, to prod Ruth it seems to me. Now is not Boaz our kinsman with whose maid you were? Just to remind Ruth that she's in somewhat of competition there were other maids present who may have had their eye on Boaz, and so she points out Boaz to her as a means of this security. And after asking these questions, she points out to an opportunity. In verse, the end of verse 2, Behold, the winnow barley, the, behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. He points to the fact that the harvest was at an end, they were coming, the harvest had been collected, and they are now going to go through the process of threshing or winnowing the barley. The threshing floor was an important feature in any land holding, any village. It was typically the best of which were located on rocky outcrops where the rock could be smoothed to a circular area at the top of the hill where it would catch all of the breezes. The barley or the other grain was laid down on the floor and then either oxen or men would pull sledges around it breaking the grain from the heads of the stalk. 
Then it would be tossed up into the air and the chaff would blow, be caught on the breeze and blow away while the seed fell back to the threshing floor, thus separating the wheat from the chaff. Boaz apparently was doing this at night because the only reason we can speculate is that that's when the evening breezes came up and would be the most propitious for, for threshing the barley or winnowing the barley. The threshing floor, though, was more than just a place of work. It was a communal gathering place. Many of the feasts throughout the Old Testament were connected to the threshing floor. Even it was a place of merriment and parties and even immorality. If you look in the book of Hosea, in Hosea chapter 9 and verse 1, they see that sometimes the threshing floor seemed to be a place of carnality. In verse 1, Do not rejoice, O Israel, with exultation like the nations, for you have played the harlot, forsaking your God. You have loved harlot's earnings on every threshing floor. It seemed like that idea that there seemed to be some, sometimes carnality attached to the gatherings there at these threshing floors. But that's where that Boaz would be located. That's where the opportunity would arise. So Naomi devises a plan. And let's read the plan beginning in verse 3. She tells Ruth, Wash yourself therefore and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor, do not make for, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. It shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will tell you what you shall do. And she said to her, All that you say, I will do. So what's Naomi's plan? First of all, she tells her to bathe herself, to wash herself, to clean herself, and then to put on different clothing. The New American Standard inserts the words best clothing. Other translations may not have that, and there's some argument about the word, whether it means just to change into a clean dress or her finery. But she's then to go down to the threshing floor and not to be noticed until he lies down. And then she is to go and uncover his feet and lie down beside him and do whatever he tells you to do. That's Naomi's plan. And Ruth says, all that you say, I will do. Now, as the story kind of unfolds, we see that Ruth followed in the spirit, but not seemingly to the letter. She, she went, but she, there were lines that she wasn't willing to cross. She kept her name excellent. But she was going to follow along with Naomi's plan. Now, whatever you think about this plan, I want you to see there's a great deal of risk involved in this. I mean, there's risk of rejection. There's risk of assuming putting these two people in a compromising position, but that is the plan that Naomi lays out to secure Ruth's, uh, Boaz's attraction and Ruth's security. And so, in the rest of chapter 3, we see this plan being executed, beginning in verse 6. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry. He went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. It happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? She answered, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. Then he said, May you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young, young men, whether poor or rich. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do what to you whatever you ask, for all, my, for all my people in the city know you're a woman of excellence. Now it's true I'm a close relative. However, there's a relative closer than I. Remain this night, and when morning comes, if he will redeem you good, let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. So, Bo, so Ruth went to the threshing floor, and she noticed where Boaz was to lie down. And after he had eaten and he had drunk and become merry, he went to lie down at the heap of grain. And she uncovered his feet and lay down. That's kind of a weird phrase. It's kind of alarming. There are people, the ideas range all over the place. For something very illicit to just simply being an idiomatic phrase that meant to lie close to someone, not necessarily at their feet. 
But can you imagine just being Boaz there in the middle of the night? And you're laying there on the threshing floor. You had a long day. It's an exciting day. And then all of a sudden you feel some stranger at your feet. Had it had to be very alarming. I mean, he raises up in verse 9 and says, who are you? And he says, Ruth answers, says, I am your maid. Spread your covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. She seems to seize on the very words that Boaz used over in chapter 2 and verse 12. In verse 12, Boaz says this, May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. The same idea, this idea of spread your covering, it's literally the idea of spread your wings. That's literally what the phrase means. So it seems to me that Ruth is claiming the blessing or turning Boaz's words back on him. She is saying that you are the means by which God is meant to be a blessing to me. She says, choose me for yourself. Furthermore, this idea becomes really the picture of claiming a person for themselves uh, to being to being claimed by God or being claimed as a wife or someone of special attraction. And we see that throughout many of the prophets, especially in the book of Ezekiel. So when Boaz notices her, he commends her and he compliments her because she had done them this great kindness. She had shown, made a choice based upon character and standing, not necessarily going after a younger man, whether he was rich or poor. And he says, I will do for you whatever you ask for all my people in the city know you are a woman of excellence. I mean, that's kind of the the same phraseology used in Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 10. This character that she is exhibited and known for, she is a woman of excellence. But he brings up this one fly in the ointment. There is a redeemer closer than myself. But he says, if he won't redeem you, I will. But to know that Naomi's plan had success, we read the end of chapter 3, where Ruth lays in beside him until the morning, and he protects her. He says, let it not be known in verse 14 that the woman came to the threshing floor. And to show his approval, he asks her to hold out her cloak, and he gives her six measures of barley to lay over her. That's really, some people say it's roughly the, uh, the amount of 60 pounds, okay? I mean, it's a big load. It's a sack of barley that he gives her to show his approval and his care and his well-intentioned meaning to redeem her. She takes it back to Naomi, and Naomi tells her in verse 18, Then she said, Wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest until he has settled it today. So that's really chapter 3, but probably the overriding question in chapter 3, what about Naomi's plan? I mean, was it well-intentioned? Was it carnal? Was it immoral? Was it just shrewd? Obviously, it, it worked to some degree. What do we make about Naomi's plan? Well, I'll tell you, commentators are somewhat divided on that. And it largely is dependent on how you view the character of Naomi. Mark had talked about the character of Naomi in chapters 1 and 2, how she had become bitter, how she had become hardened by loss and mourning. But he also pointed out the fact that Elimelech seemed to be doing what was right in his own eyes despite what God had requested. And so, which is it? Is Naomi just hardened and a figure to be pitied? Or is she acting in her own best interest and acting according to doing what is right in her own eyes? As I said, the commentators are divided. Really, there's three ideas that commentators put forward to kind of talk about Naomi's plan. The first, they say she is just acting out a common cultural practice for a maid to request marriage of a man. The difficulty with that is we really have no evidence for that. Um, except this. That's what happens. But we don't have really any evidence to support that to any great degree. The second suggestion is, is when Naomi suggests her, go and clean yourself and put on, change your dress. She's telling Ruth she needs to put off her mourning garments. And therefore, 
indicate to the community that she had put off her mourning, that she was available for courtship, she was available for marriage, she was going to resume her normal walks of life. Again, that's possible. But really the text doesn't indicate in favor of that or against it. It's just an idea that commentators have submitted. The third idea is that Naomi was potentially trying to devise her own plan to secure the well-being of her daughter Ruth or daughter-in-law Ruth. And there's really, when you read this story, it's hard to miss the almost the sexual overtones of the story. Now, don't get me wrong, Ruth and Boaz both were impeccable in their characteristics, but there just seems to be this tension in this story and how it plays out. And some of the facts for Naomi taking the shortcut is the way she wanted Ruth to go about it. Instead of approaching Boaz in the day, in the broad daylight in front of witnesses, she wanted Ruth to go to him secretly by night. Furthermore, when she talked about how this was going to come about, there's no mention of God. She, this is a plan of her own devisings. And it seems like Naomi is playing on Boaz's baser instincts rather than his higher ones. Did you notice she told Ruth to wait until he had eaten and drunk, after he had been satisfied before she approached him? Furthermore, Naomi seemed to intentionally bypass the really the nearest next of kin. It's hard for me to imagine that Naomi didn't know that there was someone nearer than Boaz. When Boaz himself was quick to bring up this nearer kin, this next redeemer. And furthermore, this plan, while it did work, really put two individuals, their reputation, two godly individuals' reputation at risk. So there's a lot about this plan that we have questions about. And so you'll just have to decide from yourself, based upon the text, which one has the most support. But let's turn our attention to chapter 4, where we begin to see the redeeming of Boaz, where Boaz goes about and fulfills his promise to redeem or have Ruth redeemed by the nearest relative. What we begin to see in the first six verses of chapter 4 is Boaz fulfilling his vow. We see the actions that Boaz takes, but really what we need to see is God's providence in the first six verses. So Boaz, according to his word, goes up to the gates of the city and sets down there. As we well know, the gates of the city are where the, the elders were gathered, the, the, the older men, the people who were con going to conduct business. That's where you would go to get something authenticated. That's where you would get witnesses. That's where, where people would be congregating that would be capable of witnessing the action or the request that Boaz would be ma make. But did you notice verse 1? So he goes up to the gate and he sits down and then just notice this word, and behold the close relative of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. You get this word, that's the way the New American Standard translates it, behold. It really, that's a word that just says just then. It's the meant to convey surprise or suddenly. Do you think it's just coincidence that this near kinsman is walking by? No, you're meant to understand that God's providence is at work to bring these things to closure and provide security for Ruth. So this near kinsman is coming by and he tells him, turn aside, friend, and sit down here. This individual is unnamed. And the fact of the matter is that word friend literally is the idea of so-and-so. He's really not important to the story except to see how much this redemption, or this redemptive act was going to cost. So he asked him to turn and sit down and begin to discuss the matter with him. Boaz inquired and took ten elders, or men of the elders of the city, as witnesses to this. And he says, you need to buy back the field of Elimelech. It seems to me throughout this whole procedure of Naomi's going down to the, going down to the land to escape the famine and her return, the field still was in her possession. Maybe it was just sold over to the use of someone else, but it was still in her name, and he had to buy the field back for her. It was still belonging to her, and they recognized that. 
And he holds that out as part of this inducement. You need to buy this field back of Elimelech for Naomi. And the close relative, he begins to consider that, and he says, yeah, I'll redeem it. I mean, why not? I mean, he's going to get the use of this field. He's going to be able to plant additional crops. He's going to gain a benefit for it. And then Boaz springs the clincher. But then, after you redeem the field, you also require Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. That's verse 5. And so the close relative, he seems to do just a quick profit and loss statement. And he says, no, I can't afford to do that. I cannot redeem it for myself because I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself, and you may have right of my redemption, for I cannot redeem it. He did this quick profit and loss statement, and he realized that if he had to redeem Ruth, the child that they would bear would inherit the land. So he would only get the use of a land for a short period of time, and then it would revert back to his brother's family, to Elimelech's line. And he said, it's just not worth it. You redeem it, for I cannot redeem it. And so, to conclude this agreement, before the ten elders of Israel, as was the custom of the day, they, he took off his sandals and gave it to the other as a manner of attestation. So, Basically, the idea of wherever your foot treads, it seems like that now belongs to you or giving something precious to use as a visible sign for the attestation. And then we have this pronouncement of a blessing by the elders of the city, beginning in verse 11. And it said, all the people who were in the court and the elders said, we are witnesses May the Lord make the woman who is coming to your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in Ephrath and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. So they pronounce this threefold blessing after witnessing this exchange, this, this relinquishing of rights. And it's a threefold blessing. The first one is they said, May the Lord make the woman who's coming into your home like Rachel and Leah. That's really a, a mighty blessing. He says, May the woman coming into your home be like the ones who produced the patriarchs. Be the, like the ones who were once barren or had trouble conceiving and then ended up conceiving along with some of their concubines, the twelve heads of the Israel. Be like these two women whose gods opened their womb. He said, first of all, may God bless you with children and children who are prominence. Secondly, may you achieve wealth and renown. And third, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. May you be like Tamar. The idea of bringing a foreign woman, a foreign wife, and then having a child that ultimately become a blessing. So they're basically in the, the richest terms possible, saying, Boaz, may your generosity and your act of redemption bear fruit, and bear fruit to the utmost degree. May, your, uh, may she conceive. May your child have prominence or a position of, of greatness. May it accrue to you wealth and renown. They pronounce this blessing on Boaz. And after blessing him, then Boaz fulfills his, his promise to Ruth. He redeems her and he marries her. And what we see in this last section before the genealogy is kind of a reversal in circumstances. So let's read verses 13 down through verse 15. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her. And the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today. And may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. So we see here... Boaz following through, and God opening the womb and blessing them with the child. And then the women gather around Naomi, and they talk about how Ruth was such a blessing to her, 
how she was better than even seven sons. This idea of a supreme blessing. But what we really see this is the complete reversal of circumstances, how she goes from Mara to bitterness back to Naomi receiving blessings and all through the Lord's hand, how the Lord blessed her even in her moments of misery. And then the chapter ends with this genealogy where we get to see that through their descendants that where David arises. So let's read just to finish out the chapter. It says, Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. The neighbor women gave him a name saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. To Perez was born Hezron, and to Hezron was born Ram, to Ram Abinadab, and Abinadab was born Nashon and Solomon. And, and to Nashon, Solomon, and to Solomon was born Boaz, and to Boaz, Obed. To Obed was born to Jesse, and to Jesse, David. So the story is complete. That the Redeemer has been found, and they have been blessed by God. And their descendants was in the kingly lineage of David and ultimately in the greatest king's lineage and that of Jesus. And the story of Ruth draws to a conclusion. So what are we to learn from this story? I've just got a few things to kind of point out. I mean, there's a number of different lessons that we could point out in this story, but I just want to point out a few. And maybe some of the noticeable ones in chapters 3 and 4, we think about this descent how God took this marriage, this unlikely union, this woman who had difficulty conceiving and blessed her with a husband and then opened her womb. And from those actions, we have David springing forth and ultimately Jesus coming into the picture. So we see God's providence at work. But I want to point out these four ideas. The first, there's this success despite human plans. In Mark's lesson last week, his very first point is pointing, pointing out the failure of human plans. That when people try to guide their own steps, they ultimately fail. But here we see Naomi's plan work. And the reason it worked is because that was according to God's will. No matter what her intention was, God ultimately wanted to find a redeemer for Ruth, and that redeemer was Boaz, and God, through his providence, made those things happen. So God can work despite human plans. They can fail or they succeed. God is not hindered by our actions, but his will be, will be accomplished, and we need to see that even in this book. The second thing I would point out from this text is really just the ideas of integrity and having an excellent name. C.S. Lewis is famous for saying, integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. And that's exactly what we find in the characters of Ruth and Boaz. Ruth goes, and at her most vulnerable state, prostrating herself before this man Boaz, puts herself in a very vulnerable position, a position that she could have been taken advantage of, and her reputation, if not her character, would be outright ruined. But both of them maintained their integrity through the midnight hours where no one was looking, even though they were at the end of the grain bins. They maintained their integrity, not because someone was watching, but because they knew the one who was watching was God. They had made a pledge to keep themselves pure and their integrity is shown. And that's kind of followed up by their excellent name, right? I mean, that's what Boaz it compliments Ruth for. When she talks about in verse 11 of chapter 3, I will do for you whatever you ask for all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. The preacher in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 1, he says there, the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth, and an excellent name is more precious than that of ointment. The idea of excellencies of character, the fact that this name has, carries forth and is recognized. And I'm just going to say something about that. Those types of things don't develop overnight. Throughout this whole story, Ruth's reputation preceded her, and it was attitude how she conducted herself. 
But the same is true of Boaz. How he was both a man of integrity, he was kind to his servants, he was generous. Those things added and built upon themselves. And the funny thing about an excellent name, it takes a long time to get one, but it could take a moment to destroy one. If they both gave in there on the threshing floor and gave in to their carnal desires, and their name could be ruined. Maybe it, was, maybe it would have gone undiscovered. I don't know. But just know that an excellent name is something to aspire to and it's something to cling to and it's something to strive for. And we see that here in this story of Ruth and Boaz. Ultimately, we think this story is about Naomi or Ruth or Boaz. This story is about God. Everywhere we see in here is God's handiwork. How God takes and blesses those even when they're at their lowest, how God works to bring about his plan, how God providentially cares for them, how God uses people for to bring blessings to others. This story is about God. And really, every story we read in Scripture is ultimately about God. And that's what we need to see. These things didn't happen by coincidence. They didn't happen because the man was just smarter than, Naomi was smarter than everyone else. These things happen because God's providential care. And we need to see this story being about God. And I think maybe the, the strongest lesson, we need to see that there's a cost to redemption. When the nearest relatives was approached by Boaz and said, hey, you need to buy this field, but you need to also redeem Ruth. He weighed the cost and he said the cost was too great to redeem her, to redeem both the land and Ruth because I'm not going to get a benefit from it. Boaz considered the cost and said it was well worth paying. But we need to understand that there is a cost associated with redemption, that there is a price to be paid, which we often call a ransom. And I I really like the phrase at the end of verse 14 in chapter 4, When Naomi is being blessed, it said, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today. And may his name become famous in Israel. Now, whether this is a shadow or a type, we have really no confirmation in the New Testament, but it's hard not to see similarities. And maybe that's because there's similarities in character. Anyone who is created in the image of God is going to bear a similar character to people we see in the New Testament, even Jesus himself. But we see this idea of this cost of redemption. The fact that Boaz was fully aware of the cost, but was still willing to pay it. He was willing to pay the cost and deprive himself of whatever it would cost to redeem the field in the short term for the reward that was laid before him. The fact that he could show love even to someone like Ruth who had been married to someone else who seemed to be at this point a proselyte potentially but not of Israel, he could show love to that. And really that picture carries over to Jesus, right? How Jesus was fully aware of the cost of our redemption how he was willing to set aside his glory to come in the form of a humble servant, how he would impoverish himself and take on flesh, how he would take on the form of a servant, how he would love the people, even the people that were going to betray him or hang him on a cross. He was willing to pay the cost of redemption. And that great statement, the Lord has not left you with a redeemer in Israel May his name become famous. The book of Ruth is the bright spot in the period of the judges. The book of Ruth is shown to be a gleaming ray of hope. And really it's shown in two individuals, both Ruth and Boaz. And it's shown in God who is the just judge and the reversal, the reverser of bad circumstances. So as we end this study, this time together, the study of Judges and Ruth, I hope that in some ways that it's profited you, as I know it has me, as I've sat through Mark's classes. But just know that we have in this picture of God's loving care for his people and his redeeming of them. So, with that, we'll conclude our lesson tonight. Uh, As I mentioned, next Wednesday night, Mark will 
continue this same class time in this same format and with some additional, for some people being present, but also on uh, live stream and Facebook, and be study, beginning a study in First Samuel called The Coming of the Kings. I hope you'll be able to join us for that on next Wednesday night. Hope you'll have a great week, rest of the week if you're free. Tomorrow night we're going to wrap up our study on evidences at 7.30. Uh, and if you can, please join us then. Have a great rest of the week, everyone. God bless.